Uh, what I'll do in this lecture is present a synopsis of Hegel's logic. There are a number of ways in which the logic of the narrative of the logic can be told. It can be presented as a theory of cognition, it can be presented as a logic of human activity, or it can be presented as a concept logic in which each successive concept arises from critique of the foregoing concept, taking for granted our knowledge of concepts as forms of thought. This last is the conventional way of reading the logic and is usually the way it is presented, even by those who agree that the content of the logic is human activity. <clears throat> I will present it here so far as possible in the conventional manner, but it's not possible to do so consistently from beginning to end. There are certain points in the logic in which the transition from one concept to the next cannot be justified by conceptual critique, but lies in an overall plan which has a deeper foundation. So how do you see the world? Do you see it like Henry Ford as one damn thing after another? Or do you see it as a tangle of multiple threads, each meaningful in itself, but more tangled than woven into a coherent fabric? Or do you grasp the world as a single rational whole, each part, each event, more or less a necessary part of the whole? Well, if you chose the latter, then you'd have to be God, wouldn't you? No human being could claim to have such an infinitely concrete concept of the world. But you might think it is like that, even if you can't understand all the links. Let's lay aside the question of whether any person has or could have such a comprehensive view of the world. We can talk about such a concept of the world as if it could exist. And imagine that the thinker of that absolute concept is not an individual, but the world itself, the human world, not any single head. So you get the idea. We imagine the world as thinking and acting out a concept of itself. Now, even this concept cannot exist because there is no world subject. But think of this world concept as the product of the learning process of the coming to be world subject as it comes to be. Now, this concept, what Hegel calls the absolute idea. But it turns out that the absolute idea is nothing other than the journey which the self-concept of the world goes through to get there. No part of that journey is abolished. The destination is only the journey. And this journey is forever underway, unfolding. So the logic is the development process, the building roman of this world concept a narrative in which the situations arise and are resolved, giving rise to new situations. It is intelligible in that sense, but not in the sense of some final destiny. The structure of the logic is three books, being, essence, and concept. This structure represents a concrete concept reflecting on the, uh, reflecting on the unfolding situation and developing a new concept which then merges into the existing concrete concept. Each of the three books concretizes one of the three processes at work here. The issue is that the first lines of one book are not given directly by critique of the last concept in the previous book. To understand these transitions, you have to understand the overall structure. In being, the movement is indeed, as Henry Ford said, one damn thing after another. This is the conception of the world which has no concept of itself, no self-consciousness. Each concept arises and through criticism is replaced by another. It is the conceptual world of the sociologist who determines the state of the world through surveys, for example. The survey forms are designed so as to prejudice the response as little as possible and there is no consultation between respondents. Everything is double blind so that the researchers' expectations cannot influence the results. And the results are reported in lists of numbers under different categories, like we run general elections. It self-identifies as the dumbest method of cognizing the world, formed without any reflection in the belief that the results reflect an objective, unprejudiced picture of the world a thoroughly unhegelian view of the world, of course, but truth comes from error. Hegel elaborates this book in the form of a critique of the concept of being, that is, the concept of the world, just as it is, one damn thing after another. 
Hegel critiques the concepts which arise from this kind of thinking, qualities and quantities, by an imminent critique. The outcome represents a kind of almanac of the world, or rather, all the concepts required for such an almanac. The second book is called Essence, and it's a critique of the concept of reflection. It is the formation process of a concept, any concept. The German word for essence is Wesen, what Gewesen means was or been. So this book tells the story of the concrete existing concept, which is the result of the re past self-understanding reflecting on present being as each new moment comes forward. Here the concepts come forward in pairs, corresponding to the process of reflection. Essence is not, as in normal language, the end point, what something really is deep down. Rather, essence is the endless process of going deeper, of peeling the layers off the onion. It is the development of a theoretical view of the world, a world of laws, patterns, processes, and theories. And each new theory, as each new theory comes forward, does not abolish the preceding theory, but rather pushes it into the background. The third book is the concept logic itself. This book is the development process of a concept, which begins with a bare abstraction, an aha moment, and concludes with the absolute idea. The concept logic itself has a tripartite structure. The first part of the concept logic, the subject, we have the internal development of a concept, which means the interaction of the universal, particular and individual moments of a concept. The universal is the simple idea which unites the entire concrete concept. The individual is each and all of the finer individual instances which are subsumed under the universal. The particular is the various means by which individuals are subsumed as part of the universal, the various definitions of the universal. This is not an abstract general concept. Individuals do not fall under the universal simply because of a shared attribute. These are real living concepts which have arisen out of the complex process of reflection. In its second part, called the object, we have the interaction of the concept with all the other concepts, which are also subjects, and the variety of ways in which concepts relate to one another, either mechanically or finding an affinity or adapting to one another. And the third part of the concept logic is called the idea. And here, Hegel follows the process whereby every special concept merges with and penetrates every other, and they become in a sense, special forms of each other and develop together as a concrete whole, like a kind of ecosystem. Here Hegel is considering no longer single concepts, but the development of the entire, entire self-conceptions of the world, subjects, objects, which can only be understood as a self-conscious concrete whole. So to make sense of the logic, you have to have this overall structure in mind but the way each book unfolds is a little different. There is a brief preamble at the beginning of each book before the overall tripartite structure of the book unfolds. The preamble is the analytical phase of the critique in which Hegel addresses the abstract concept which forms the subject matter of the book and critiques it. The first book is about being, which he shows is an empty concept, even though it was the concept with which philosophy began in ancient Greece. He shows that the only meaningful way of grasping being is as a one or unit. The concept of one forms the starting point for the synthetic unfolding of the logic of being. From one, he goes through the various concepts of quantity, each unfolding from the one before pushing it to its limits and then going beyond. As quantity goes beyond a certain point, it becomes a new quality, and the unity of quantity and quality, so much of this and so much of that, is measure. The development of measure is just to proliferate into more and more measures, leading to a kind of image of the world which resembles, resembles an almanac. Excuse me. 
It is like the picture of a community which you get from a phone book or the census, or for that matter, a general election, utterly lacking in theoretical or conceptual content, but nonetheless an accurate picture of the world. The systematic dialectic arising at uh, so this, the systematic dialectic of being arises out of critique of the concept of the one. It is vital to understand the distinction between the analytical phase, which concludes with the unit, and the synthetic phase of exposition of the initial unit once it has been identified. In the second book, it critiques the concept of identity or self-reflection. It goes like this. Identity only meaningful if there is some difference, but it is actually diversity. But that can only mean some specific difference, that is an opposition, something which is the same and not the same, a contradiction. But every contradiction must have its ground. Ground is the truth of identity, which is determined by successive reflection. That is Hegel's analysis of reflection. You've got to excuse my uh, telescoped <laughs> coverage of a whole part of the logic there. You have to read the whole book to get it in a more expanded form. But if you think about that, that will make sense. Okay, to explain the concept of ground, if there's a difference, that is to say a contradiction, then there has to be an explanation for that difference. Every contradiction points to a contradiction at a deeper level, and that is its ground. So reflection is this process of endlessly searching for the ground of a contradiction in a deeper, more far-reaching contradiction. From ground, Hegel identifies a series of pairs of concepts, thing and matter, form and content, cause and effect, and more. Each pair emerges as a new problematic arising from critique of the foregoing problematic. The final outcome of this process of reflection is the array of concepts from which a theoretical view of some development can be constructed, but always on the basis of an existing array of concepts. It's like a comprehensive textbook of social theory as it is at one moment, or rather the concepts utilized in such a textbook. So it is a step forward from the almanac we got in the first book. But what it lacks is what you might find in a journal article when someone proposes an entirely new idea and a new concept of a problem being addressed. Essence is limited to reflection on the basis of an existing array of concepts. The transition to a new concept, the third book, is always a leap, an aha moment. The concept logic begins with a critique of a simple concept. On the one hand, it is merely a name, but instances fall under that universal name according to various particular criteria, such as their use, their connection with others or whatever. But also it is nothing other than all those finite, concrete, individual instances on whatever basis they are united. Consider a union, for example. The union, its branches, committees, leaders, and so on, and its base membership. This three-sided conception of a concept differs from the positivist two-sided conception in which individuals fall under, under the universal solely as the result of a shared attribute, like all plumbers belong to the plumbers union or something, full stop. So that the Universal has no content other than the shared attribute. If a concept was entirely captured as a common attribute, then it's a redundant concept. Hegel's recognition of the inadequacy of any definition of a concept allows him to represent concepts in their full concreteness. The subject unfolds through the synthetic exhibition of the three moments, universal, individual, and particular. Frustratingly, it's only in the penultimate section of the science of logic, around page 801 out of 844, that Hegel explains the method of the logic beyond the endless repetitions that it is self-construing and so on. 
only in these last paragraphs do we get an explanation and then far from transparent terms. As a result, this distinction between analytic and analysis and synthesis is largely unknown and even denied by Hegelians. Hegel claims characteristically that his dialectic is simultaneously both analytic and synthetic and not an alternation between the two, all well and good, but the logic speaks for itself. Admittedly, approaching any subject anew, the critic must be equally synthetic and analytic. The critic must follow the movement of the object itself, and the object does not come ready with ready-made signage for the benefit of the cognizing subject. But an understanding of the role of analysis and synthesis, and an understanding of how Hegel conducts each method of critique, is more than a little useful if we're going to learn how to emulate Hegel rather than simply echo his results. Very often, the analytical moment of the dialectic is overlooked because in studying the work of great white writers of the past, the subject matter which the writer seized upon and conceptually reconstructed appears to be just given as if obvious or chosen arbitrarily. For example, Marx begins capital with the analysis of the commodity and on the basis of the contradiction between labor time and use value in the commodity he is able to derive a dialectical concept of capital. But why did he seize upon the commodity? Why not the state or money or power or something? 16 years past his first reflections on, between his first reflections on political economy in 1843 and the writing of the critique of political economy in 1859, beginning with the commodity. That process of identifying the one is the most arduous and least understood. In the book Hegel for Social Movements, I devote 90 pages to a step-by-step -step reading of the logic. With the book, the reader has the capacity to take their time and read through the quotes from Hegel and my explanations at their own pace and reflect. In the context of a lecture, I fear that you'd all go cross-eyed if I were to try to emulate such a presentation here. So I'll wind up and let's see what people make of it in the discussion. So um, I'd like some questions now for good. Um, you must have questions about this stuff and this stuff just totally flummoxed everyone by presenting the logic in 25 minutes. Um, but let's see what we've got. Anybody? Pauline, we haven't heard from you yet. Oh. You're not planning enough. Ah, sorry, we have a question. Michael, proceed. Yeah, hi, Andy. Uh, we uh, touched on this, um, these words that you use, the abstract and the concrete. Mm -hmm. And I know there's a lot more behind that in Hegel's mm -hmm. philosophy, but um, it's something that is tricky to wrap one's head around without um, being familiar with it. And I was just wondering, like, if it, you think it is worth um, exploring and elaborating upon in greater detail? Um, and if there might be some uh, illustrations or examples you might be able to provide to kind of flesh things out? For sure. Uh, when this is over, there's, I've written an article on abstract and concrete in Marx's Hegel. So you can look at it in three or four pages. Uh, yeah, abstract, um, think of abstract like extract in the sense that something's taken out of its context. Therefore, what you've got is something very simple because the complexity in a concept is derived from its connections with everything else. That's its content. The content of a, of a concept is its connections with everything else. But when you extract something or you abstract it, you've just got a very simple idea. That's what makes it abstract. It's removed from the world. It doesn't have any earthly connections any longer. It's just abstracted. Concrete, on the other hand, means that what you, it has many connections with the, the rest of the world. It's got its feet in the ground, right? A concrete footings. Uh, it's, as Marx says, it's the concentration of many abstractions. So a thought, the way a concept develops is that you... Um, for example, with being, you have uh, a certain kind of abstractness because each moment just appears on its own as if it had nothing behind it. It's just suddenly there's this situation or this opinion, and then there's another, 
and then there's another. So they're very abstract in that sense. But at the same time, they're very concrete because it's all in there. If you, uh, you the want to understand what's going on, you have to start with what exists. And the, the you say the present moment is rich in material, but poor in concept. When you've analyzed it, and you say, hey, what's going on here is a, uh, a challenge to the uh, liberal ethos or something. You end up, wind up with a very abstract concept because it's very simple, but it's concrete in the sense because you've worked over all that material. And the all that material that went into the uh, formation of a simple concept to describe what's going on now makes it also concrete. So thinking is always going from a kind of abstract concreteness to a concrete abstractness, right? So they're not separate concepts, okay? But uh, if you want to follow up some more, there's a special article on the topic. Uh, Ryan. Thanks, Andy. Um, I was wondering if you could, maybe in a similar vein to that, elaborate on Hegel's use of identity and maybe non-identity, seeing as that's a pretty... Uh, a pretty common and a, a, a widely used tool in his in his thinking. Can you maybe elaborate on that some more? Yeah, I mean, you can relate to it with that bit in, in Trotsky's writings in 1940, uh, when he says A equals A, that's the law of identity. And that's, you know, a quote out of Hegel, Hegel uses that. But as soon as you write A equals A, I mean, there's a left A and a right A, isn't there? Otherwise, it's a senseless statement. Because the, the the one on the left is different from the one on the right simply because they're on the left and the right, and it's the fact that they they are different that makes identity um, a meaningful thing. So identity means the equation of two things which are actually different. It's and and so it proceeds. Um, the there's that kind of logical thing that says, well, I've just shown you that identity means difference and it means a specific difference, therefore a, a contradiction. Uh, but that happens in real life. And I think I use this example in the next, uh, you know, after this, the break. Uh, we were talking before about the um, uh, anti-lockdown movements. You know, they all roll onto the street and say, we're all here for the same thing, aren't we? Right, you know, we're all here together. We'll show these people. But time goes by and actually have their conference up in Canberra. And, you know, someone's there because they want to sell uh, sort of wellness, med you know, snake oil. Someone else is there because they want to bring Christ's message to the earth. Someone else wants to set up a, you know, a dictatorship to sort these lefties out. In actual fact, they're there for quite different reasons. Um, so the the point is, like when Marx says, it's not that they discovered the class struggle, they showed that the class struggle leads to socialism. It's the thing about identity is that identity leads to difference. So no sooner does the women's movement form than there's an argument between sort of glass ceilings and equal pay because of the class differences that are within the women's movement. And that's a... It's a necessary development of an abstract idea. You know, we're all here together. Uh, that actually says, well, actually, you know, we're, we're not all the same. Therefore, it's not that the identity was a mistake. It's just that identity has to become more concrete. Yeah? And it's a necessary course of development of any idea from simple to concrete as it reflects. Matthew. Hi, Andy. Um, thanks for that so far. Um, I wanted to ask if you could expand a little bit more on the relationship between the, the quantitative and the, the qualitative or, or where that jump from the quantitative change to a qualitative change takes place. And just, just for, for, for where my thinking was the last little week or so, I've been thinking about um, Marx's concept of, of value and how, you know, as humans, we naturally view things as having the the quality of value, but, you know, in, in, but all of a sudden, you know, in the, in the bourgeois society and probably before that too, you know, 
the next question is, well, what quantity of value does this have? You know, we make the leap from the quality of value to the quantity of value. So, yeah, I don't know. It, that's just where I've been thinking about. So I wanted yeah, to no, expand on that. That's a very that. important one. Um, I, I think some people that, you know, there's the famous saying of Lenin's that you can't understand Marxist capital until you've read the whole of the logic. And, and so people can make a leap from there to saying, well, the logic begins with quantity and quality, so the capital must be... Oh, look, it is. He's talking about quality of concrete labour and quantity of abstract labour and sort of then get carried away on the identification there, which is actually erroneous. But the whole critique in the first phase of the being is, is, is actually under the heading of quality. Like a being, there's, there's something out there, right? You think like you're you're in a train coming towards a large metropolis, and it's the early hours of the morning. You know, the first lights just beginning, uh, and you look out the window. Things are flashing by: a farmhouse, a field, a tree, ah, a little house, oh, another house. You know, a road, street lights, and gradually you start to see something emerging. And as time, you know, ah. Oh, you know, here's a suburban street, tower blocks, railway sidings. Ah, we're coming into the centre of the metropolis. So experiences like that, it begins with um, isolated moments. And so the, it's, a, a, it's just qualitative, but it, it has to develop uh, into quantity. And the, the majority of the, the uh, logic of being is the development of the concept of quantity. That's its real essence. Now, the but it typifies a structure of Hegel's um, <clears throat> approach to any general abstract concept. And in fact, Hegel says being isn't a concrete concept at all. It's just an abstraction. Right? And in fact, it, in its true historical meaning, it's an empty concept. So... What he does in that series, which I think I rehearsed with you in this can telescoped form uh, last week, is he shows that the only meaning of, uh, you know, the way, only way being could be grasped is in terms of a unit, right? So you, you have to, if you're going to grasp this, this uh, messy, chaotic uh, world out there that you're seeing, then it has to be by finding a unit. And a unit then you can count and you can form quantities. Now, of course, the uh, quantities immediately generate uh, new qualities, you know, like a certain quantity makes sense, you know, up to a certain point, but beyond the point, uh, uh, there's a new quality involved. So it's, it's a dialectic of quantity and quality, that's right. But the point is to analyze value. You, you, it's no good just trying to critique the concept or you. You've got to critique the concept of value, but the way the form that takes is to get down to what is a unit of value. And Marx says so from the very first lines of capital. Something like the wealth of modern societies presents itself as a vast mass of commodities. Right? So it tells you right out. The, 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 he's already done that analysis, right? It took him 16 years or something from when he first read uh, James Mill. But he says, ah, look, this is about commodities. And then you can get into it, can't you? You know, how commodities exchange, where they come from, why they're produced, you can start to make a value. But if you just start off with value, well, in fact, bourgeois political economy, by the turn of the century, decided that value... Uh, was a word that should be banished from political economy altogether, and it was for the best part of a century, um, because they disregarded it as an abstraction, it was impenetrable, meaningless. But Marx, on the other hand, showed that it's the uh, it's the it's the social form of value is a commodity. So th that that's the cognitive process that that Hegel is demonstrating. Um, somebody else, uh, Abbott, please. Okay, just a rejoinder to the whole quantity, qua uh, qualitative and quantitative change thing. Mm -hmm. I believe I think this is in your book. I browsed it, um, there, especially with that part of measure. The way I understand it is that 
um, quantitative change, I mean, there's a level to it afterwards. Uh, things, it, it, it's not the same. You're not talking about the same thing anymore. I mean, for instance, I think the example there was that, uh, what if, um, let's imagine somebody losing a thousand dollars. So if this guy were a millionaire, that's nothing. That's just a quantitative change. The balance in his bank goes from 1 million to 990 mm. something. But if you only had, say, 1,500, that, that means you're near destitution if that happens to you. So mm. the quality, uh, the, the quality of um, um, that very same amount of quantitative change, um, is very different. So for the rich guy, it's it's just another quantitative. It's just a num. It's just a numbers yeah, I'll thing. Put it in a different way. I bet y yeah. you say you have here. We have a house. This is a small house, like what I live in, little terrace house. There's a big house. There's an even bigger house. There's a bigger house. No, no, no. That's not a big house. That's a mansion, right? Oh, here's a mansion. Here's a bigger mansion. No, that's not a bigger mansion. That, that's a you know that's a a public service building that's a tower block or something you know what i mean um and that's the, the way quantity transforms into quality but that put it the trouble is that this trope about quantity turning into quality uh was banged away by Engels and elevated to the level of one of the three laws of dialectics and if you want to make that you know the basis of understanding dialectics in the 21st century, it's not really good enough, quite honestly. Um, it's a nice little thing to demonstrate, you know, how one thing becomes another. It, it can make a point. But um, nowadays we live in a world which is so fluid, it's much more important to be able to find fixed points in that world than to demonstrate that things change. We live in such a different world than the 1870s in which, uh, 80s, in which uh, Engels wrote that stuff about quantity and quality. But your exposition was perfectly correct, nonetheless, I bet. Anyone else, please? Now, Pauline, I haven't heard from you. That's PJ. For, this is our third week round, and you haven't spoken on the, the Zoom meeting. Pauline, you've got any issues or things you'd like to raise? <laughs> Just put on the spot here. No. Um, so I have caught up on the first week. And yeah, so last week was the first one that I have attended live. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot to unpack um, this with this uh, lecture number five. Um, I must admit, I'm still needing to unpack it. So I'll definitely mm. be going over the book and maybe reading those 90 pages of um, mm. sort of going through the logic. Um, I think one thing that um, I think there's always an oversimplification of Hegel and definitely like this is all, a lot of it's quite new to me where uh, there's kind of this vulgar understanding that dialectical thinking is you have a thesis, then an antithesis, then a synthesis. And I really like that this, unpacks that that's a lot more complex than that um mm. and yeah so this is sort of opening my eyes to how that can be quite a more complex and um nuanced uh process it's not the sort of sim oversimplified dialectics that mm. we see um in i guess popular thinking about it so mm. that's maybe a comment more than a question yeah that idea about i can ha i have difficulty getting my tongue around these words Analysis, synthesis, an, an analysis, the thesis, antithesis, and synthesis, right? My mouth isn't made to pronounce those words, but um, it was invented by a, a German sort of popularizer, popular philosopher, uh, and propagated extremely quickly and thoroughly. And you've got people like Proudhon and Kautsky parroting it like it's the last word in Hegelianism, but it doesn't exist in Hegel. It does fairly represents some elements here and there but the, the the one of the things which i emphasize is the the difference in movement that you see in the book of being where i, I use henry ford's aphorism and the the development in the book of essence where uh one as one what comes forward is not another concept but another pair of concepts yeah, uh, that 
you have a form and, and um, content, and then you have cause and effect, and then you have possibility and real possibility. So things come forward in pairs, and the, the, when a new concept comes forward, it doesn't abolish the previous one that remains there, but it's pushed into the background as one uh, one problematic comes into the foreground. And that's sort of how theory develops. And then in the third book, in the concept book, the development is different again, because what you have then is um, a concept comes along, like uh, a movement begins, someone raises a demand, you know, that uh, whatever, you know, that the, uh, the was it, um, what do they call it, you know, unemployment benefit or something is too low and this is a, a big fault of the government they should rectify it. So a campaign develops around that. And that enters into a whole series of existing concepts. So um, all the, the, the uh, sort of, um, what is it? I, I'm very bad at sort of improvising these metaphors, but you know, you've got the welfare sector and you've got the economists and you've got the political parties and so on. They all start pitching in on this, right? And saying, no, 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 that's wrong. Yes, yes, about time. Or you haven't thought of this or something. So then it's each new concept like that one comes along. It doesn't overthrow the existing state of affairs but it sort of enters into it and forms different relations and con uh, merges with different ones, different alliances, and it transforms the situation. So you have a concrete concept which is continually becoming more concrete as it absorbs new concepts, as new contradictions are exposed. So it's quite a different form of movement. And if, you, if Hegel discovered there was only one form of movement, and he could have just said thesis, synthesis, synthesis, and then taken a holiday. Uh, but in fact, the forms of movement right through all different, not only the logic, but his other books about uh, social theory, uh, nat nature, art, and everything also have different forms of movement in them. The, the dialectic takes many different shapes. Anyone Can else? I, um... Yes. Can I just quickly ask for a point of clarification? I don't want to jump in because Veronica no, you're has a right. question. Uh, you mentioned that um, that notion was popularized and propagated by a German thinker, but you didn't yes. say the name. Do you, do you uh, remember who that was? Yeah. Um, Heinrich. Um, oh, he's something like uh, Polly Boyce. The, the, the first part of his name, I can't remember. The second part is B. A with umlauts on top of it, U.S., which is pronounced the voice. Um, it, it, I'll give it a Google. Yeah, yeah, Heinrich. Yeah, just make up a something voice, and you'll probably and you probably pick it up. Thanks, Andy. Um, Janina, you look like you're about to say something. No, no, I, it's I'm taking in as much as I can. Mm. But it's a very, oh. very big area. <clears throat> so I just noticed a couple of hands up. Ronnie, please. I just wanted to say to all the people here, because um, I'm an educator, I can't help myself, that this is pretty hard. And if people are feeling like it's a very slippery fish, that's all right. Mm. And I don't think there's anybody here that understands everything about this and he might be starting to approach a very sophisticated level I think um, so go you if you're here and the second thing is that we're each approaching this through the lenses of what we already know so we'll try and relate it to whether it's Marx whether it's Vygotsky whether it's Davidoff whatever it is mm. I heard Engels I heard all sorts mm. of people mentioned over the last couple of weeks and um, we will continue to struggle and I reckon I could live to 92 and I still won't have all this sorted out and it's okay it's all right to feel like that and that's kind of part of the joy of it it's the joy of being here and being able to struggle with this together and to listen to Andy so thanks for everybody um, contributing something that's all I wanted to, a bit of a, a cheer squad 
Well, well done, uh, uh, Ronnie. Uh, so, someone was a PJ. Pauline just put in, or someone put in the, the the chat box the correct name of that fellow that invented the little slogan. But within a second, Steve, what Ronnie says is correct, and what you're describing is a learning process where we each have a certain concrete concept of the world have come along here and I've thrown in another concept uh, and at the moment it comes in with a few scraps of things that you've drawn out of it it's in a sense you've abstracted from the experience of listening to me some things and then there's a concrete concept your present knowledge and then there's this uh, impact if you like and I assume that anyone that liked what they were doing here will then read and we'll follow up the clues I've given, and not only Mr. Charlie Boys, but um, uh, other issues uh, to maybe read the Hegel book, to read about activity theory, and, and then uh, develop more concretely. Steve. Oh, hi, everyone. Sorry, I was late to class. But uh, yeah, uh, thanks, Veronica. That's, uh, I think, it, yeah, identifying as a struggle, definitely. It's true for me, and I think part of why this stuff is so hard is because it uh, bumps up pretty hard against like common common sense thinking of our society. And I I just sort of noted two things in particular which I found compelling but challenging in that sense in the first uh, in the lecture. One was the idea that essence, capital E essence for Hegel, <clears throat> essence is not the is not about deep down, you know, it's not like the true thing deep down, but rather, I think you wrote peeling onion layers. I thought that was really interesting but difficult. And the other interesting but difficult thing was uh, the in inadequacy of defining concepts and, and that kind of being our way to grapple our way through things. And both of those things, yeah, just bump up so much against common common sense of this society and, and in my brain. And I'm wondering if you have any thoughts to help us uh, navigate those those two yeah, Thank for sure. Thanks, Steve. There are two good observations. You start with the concept of essence. Um, can put it, in feminist theory, there's a word called essentialism. And this is, uh, if you like, opposition to essence in the old-fashioned meaning of the word, the, the normal everyday meaning, that uh, given some set of appearances beneath that, there's an essence, what it really is. And it, essentialism in feminist theory is the the uh, belief that a woman is a woman. S stop arguing. You know, what have you got between your legs? That's the end of the question. Now, there's since that uh, phrase was coined maybe 50 years ago, uh, of course, the understanding of gender and sexual politics has developed a lot. And that's the the... the so at one stage or another, the idea of, of what sexual difference or gender difference was, was as simple as what's between your legs. But of course, uh, life experience, and not pers just personal life experience, but the unfolding of history itself, once you get critical movements come onto the scene that challenge fixed ideas, then you dig deeper and deeper. And we find that uh, concepts like gender are extremely multifaceted, but there's not, or certainly in this instance, this is an ongoing thing. There's not an answer to what is the essence of being a woman. It's a very complex business. And so um, what Hegel gives you is the array of concepts which arise when you get involved in that process of digging below the surface and exposing the ground of successive contradictions. Right. Um, remind me the the other. Oh yes, definitions. Yeah. Look, as soon as you got someone saying to you, "What's your definition? How do you define that?" Then you know that you're uh, you're dealing with a you know a positivist, a mechanical thinker who wants to trap you into abandoning your dialectical 
uh, understanding of a concept as something concrete and adopting some little definition, which will then reduce that concept to being a, a formal logical concept of being a name for things sharing uh, some uh, attribute in common or some simple definition. But worthwhile concepts uh, have multiple definitions in different circumstances, as seen from different social positions, as they've evolved historically. And if you know something about an issue, a concept, then you are aware of its history. You Like uh, we had a little discussion before we got going about art. Now, any, anyone who's assessing a piece of work of art doesn't just see the, the image in front of them. They know the whole history of art, and they know they see allusions Allusions, not illusions. Allusions to the history of art in a work of art. You know, they, they see something that's new, that may be undeveloped, but it's new, right? So, the concept of art then uh, is not a thing like giving a definition of it, but it's an historical practice. So, it's it, it, it's um, going to put it as soon as you get tied into giving a definition, like I think. Um, maybe last week I, I said, uh, I'm going to, the, the substance of human life is activity. And I said, I'm not going to give you a definition of activity <laughs> because we're all adult human beings and we live in the world. You know what activity is now to assert to a, a formal logician. This is, this is, I'm obfuscating. You know, I'm being deliberately obstructive. But the thing is, that's what I'm going to start with, the general idea of, of activity, and then I'm going to critique it. If I instead say, oh, activity means X, Y, Z, then forget about activity. You go to my definition, and you're off on a tangent somewhere else. Right? So refu refuse definitions. There are multiple definitions of any worthwhile concept. Um, Rachel, you're... What have you got on your mind? Yeah. So I just wanted to respond to you responding to Stephen there on the, the definition point. Mm. Um, I agree with you um, is the first point to be ultimately clear on. I totally agree that as soon as we start getting into definition games, you've sort of immediately lost any point of the, the, the discussion at hand. Mm. But this course is Hegel for social movements, right? Mm. And um so so to sort of step back a little bit the the modern you know right wing are quite effective at maybe using naive definitions vulgar definitions of their concepts to get popular support and obviously over the last maybe yeah. 10 20 years especially you've seen really effective and that that's obviously not me endorsing them just descriptive, uh, effective use of, of, well, yeah, you know, social movements on the right have, have had effect on politics now a lot more so than on the left, I would say. Mm. So with, with, with this in mind, how, how, how do you foresee, I don't know if this is coming up later in the course, but how do you foresee a leftist movement, uh, keeping the, the richness of, of, of understanding that, that you've elaborated here, avoiding concrete definitions, um, but also galvanize an effective social movement? Well, I mean, I can just contribute one thing. Yeah, I'm trying, you know, in in sense that my, my interest and my particular little thing that I throw into the ring for social movements is the time I've spent studying uh, fundamental concepts, ontology, uh, dialectical logic, and so on. Um, I have to say that, I mean, uh, people probably don't know me, but I haven't been, this is not what my whole life's been doing. I was an uh, active trade unionist, member of left parties for all my working life, uh, and then I retired in order to do this. So I've had the past 20 years to develop this stuff. And, and of course, I wanted to retire. Um, you know, as soon as the numbers added up, who wants to go on continuing with wage slavery after all? Um, but 
It was also a fact that I became intensely aware, having experienced the peace movement of the 60s and in the 70s, and the the eventual collapse of of, all, of Marxist sort of movements, socialist movement, it became obvious that we had to do some theoretical work. So I um, hope that while we're fighting on issues and we're fighting for human emancipation and we're extending solidarity to anyone else who's struggling, uh, will be uh, the more effective than we're clear about these concepts. That's all. And part of that is that I, I will show how concepts are not just thought forms, but something exists in some sort of ethereal cyberspace or something, but exist in human activity. And so that you can reason and think about the problems that are coming up in the development of the movement as development of theory, living development of theory, coming out of the struggle itself. So that we don't have practical work activism on one side and you know theoretical concept and critique on the other, but activism is an active critique, a theoretically informed active critique. 